it's Lizzie, and today we're trying something a little bit different. This is actually part one of a special series. My co-hosts and longtime friends, Sasha and Tony, have agreed to share their personal stories of triumph over narcissistic abuse. If you or someone you know need to leave an abusive situation, there are some links to resources in today's show notes. Also, just keep in mind, we are recording from our respective homes, so patients with squeaky chairs, my phantom phone alarm, and any other housey kind of sounds is really appreciated. Thanks so much. Let's get into it. Dear listeners, just when you thought that it couldn't get any worse, it's about to get funnier. Sincerely, Tactless. Tony, you want to tell us how you and your ex met? Oh my God. Well, sure. Why not? Um, Best place to meet a narcissist, I assume. We met at a church. Oh, That's shit. even better, right? <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, we met at a uh, a church concert, and I actually ended up dating one of her best friends first. So we dated for a little while, and I just didn't even really think too much of my wife at the time. I thought she was <laughs> I thought she was too young for me, because <laughs> you know when you're 16. Months make a difference to everybody. They Everyone like, knows they that. They really do. They so, do. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how it worked out. I did her friend off and on for a little bit before I even recognized she was uh, around, I guess you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. And around and around. They, they, they stick. <laughs> they stick on you like some gum on your shoe. It's a nice way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to trying to be classy. Keep it classy. At least gum was flavorful at some point. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it could be a good analogy in a way. <laughs> 15, 20 minutes loses its flavor. <laughs> zebra zebra striped gum. That's yeah. what it was. Those tattoos never work out either. No matter they how don't. many of those pieces of gum you put in your mouth at one time, they, they never last. Sad. It never does. Nope. Mm-mm. So at what point did you guys like start dating dating? Ooh. This is another fun one for you guys. Okay. Um, so we started like casually dating at first, like just kind of she would come over and hang out or whatever. And I ended up um I was dating another girl at the time. <laughs> I ended up I having a thing. party at my house and uh invited both of them because there oh. is the mark of a true gentleman. So after that, she was pretty upset with me, hmm. uh, rightfully so. So um, after that, we kind of didn't talk to each other for some time mm-hmm. until I decided that I was indeed a uh, a jerk to her. So I apologized like you should. And then I took yes. it too far and started dating her again. Oh, no. That's how you apologize. I should have learned the first time. <laughs> Take her back. Yeah. Yeah. I should have just uh, left it at that. I'm sorry and walked away, but I didn't. You there can you only go. turn back time, right? <laughs> what Cher <laughs> teaches us. <laughs> only we listen to her. Uh, it was the outfit that was off-putting to me. I couldn't, I couldn't get on board. You can yeah. get past the outfit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that video? Yeah, the cannery. <laughs> the <little> battleship. <laughs> I couldn't get on board. Sorry. Oh Lord, yeah. Sorry, sure. Yeah, you, you can hear a word coming out of her mouth with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, next question: What did dating this person look like after you, quote unquote, apologized? Oh yeah, well, uh, it was. I mean, it was good at first. You know, that's Please. that's kind of the way that it works. Um, you know, all the the love bombing. It was about that. Yeah, it was just like all about wanting to spend time with me and be with me and do stuff for me and if i was sick she would bring me stuff mm-hmm. it was very nice at first um once things started to get serious is when those those little flags started to pop up here and there i mean even before we got married getting accused of cheating on her when i obviously wasn't you know i had uh, gotten away from from that kind of stuff 
Um, I remember one instance in particular, I brought my car over to my buddy's house. Uh, we were putting a clutch in it and we decided at the same time, why not put some, put some struts and an axle shaft in too, mm -hmm. because the clutch wasn't fun enough by itself. So <laughs> <As you> do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> wasted the whole day on that. So it took forever for us to get the car apart and then back together for me to leave. And then, man, by the time I got to her apartment, because we we're living separate at the time, she was so mad at me. She was accusing me of cheating on her and whatever else. And I was just like, you know what? I was working on my car. Like I couldn't go anywhere. The car was in pieces the whole time, mm. but she wasn't having any of that, you know? Yeah. They, uh, they kind of create their own truth in their, in their own mind. So I really should have taken that as a big hint because that was kind of a big fight that we had too mm -hmm. about me wanting to repair my own car, which is definitely not something you should fight about when you're dating. But yeah. uh, those things just got worse, you know, as time went on. And I, yeah. and I felt like I needed to be committed because to me, growing up as a Christian, if you want to commit to a relationship, you're in. Dating Come together. good or bad or hell or high water, you're you know, you're working out those issues and, and you're persevering. Right. I really should have taken a hint, but I was uh, kind of blinded by, by the, uh, the situation at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. It definitely happens. So like, at what point did you start getting like marriage minded? Who, who brought up the, the conversation first? Oh God. Um, I don't even know that I could tell you that now. I don't remember if it was me or her, but if I had to guess, I would, uh, <laughs> I would you guess, that, guess. That she was laying those hints down for me to pick up and they, they kind of moved in that direction quickly, which is another mark of somebody that's uh, got everything to lose is they want to hook you as fast as possible. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it happened pretty fast. It was, it was a, a quick buildup yeah. and then eloping. Yeah. You want to tell us uh, how that Wouldn't came about? <laughs> wouldn't recommend it that's my dream wedding though <laughs> i mean saves you a hell of a lot of money that's for sure there's that yeah. and you get you get a, a walk out and it'd be on a free honeymoon yeah because you already paid to get there for the wedding and we went to mm -hmm. vegas like walked out and you're on the strip we were sick of well i was mostly sick of trying to plan a wedding it's it not is my, a lot it's not my it's thing stressful. you know mm -hmm. planning and organizing all that stuff and then paying for it no thanks that's why i was down for that just well, get it over with go there and do it and there you go makes sense what was uh what was the wedding planning process like i mean it was just with somebody like that they're super opinionated about everything they need to be in control of whatever's going on so you know Anybody in your family that wants to help, wants to put in any sort of assistance with the uh, exception of giving you money because, you know, narcissists love to spend that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they just don't want anybody to do anything or plan anything outside of their, their scope of what they want and it has to be how they want it and when they want it and the color they want it has to smell right and look right <laughs> and taste right and feel right. And if any one of those things looks half wrong, forget it. Yeah. They'll set you on fire. So Sasha, question for you. Do you remember yeah. when you met her for the first time? Because I do not. <laughs> I hate to say it. <laughs> That's a good question. I think I met her before she was with Tony. Um, I actually went to that church where she was going. Okay. And I had a friend in common with her. And it was just a brief encounter. She basically ignored me. And uh, that was the gist of my first meeting with her, pretty much. Oh, wow. You that didn't have anything good. to offer. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, basically. I wasn't a man, so she wasn't in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do you remember meeting her again, like as Tony's girlfriend or Tony's fiance at all? You know what? I really don't remember many times, but I do remember going to what we lovingly refer to as the wedding reenactment. Oh, yeah. Um, after the elopement, yeah. they both returned to town and then they planned a ceremony at someone's house. And I remember walking in the front door of the house. She was coming down the stairs directly across from the front door. I said, Hi, how are you? She looked at me with this look of distaste, didn't say a word to me, and just turned around and walked away. Oh so I guess gosh. you could say it's similar to the first encounter I had with her, but 
it yeah. was a little bit more rude that time, Ouch. you know, a little more blatantly. And then later on, she denied that that ever happened. She said, no, I said hi to you. I was very polite to you. That's a common And I called her on it and she, yeah, she wouldn't let it go. She was like, no, I said hi to you. I was like, no, you did not. Yeah. So yeah, that was that. It's like creating their own truth part, right? Yes. And never um, backing down from it, right? Yeah. Because if you yell louder, then you're more true than if you're not fighting it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. It's weird the things that they argue over so like adamantly and it's yeah, just not true, but they'll they're passionate like, about yeah. the lies. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's insane. Just delightful. Now you were married to a narcissist as well, Sasha. What did he think of the ex? He was not a fan. I feel like narcissists clash a lot because they're always looking for that control. Mm -hmm. So none of them really get along. They're always like fighting for that power over people. And he did not like her. He was just like, no, you know, he recognized that day because he was with me actually when I ran into her that time. And she said, she said hi to me and he was there and he was just like, why is she lying? Like he even recognized that that was pretty nutso, but Ah. yeah he wasn't a fan of her either so he recognized his own kind <laughs> yeah apparently they do wow. yeah, and out they in the wild they other. can recognize each other yeah. yeah interesting interesting so mr tony now the elopement how did that because none of us were there <laughs> how did that go? oh he missed out <laughs> that's great day. oh my god i should have ended it then too we we got in a fight before we even got eloped Oh. We were driving to, we drove to Vegas. Mm -hmm. We're driving to Vegas and we were getting into town. And I thought that, uh, that the hotel was one way on the street and it was actually the other way. And God forbid I made a wrong turn. We had like the biggest knockdown drag out just because of that. It was terrible. <laughs> that sounds awful. But that, at that point I was like, Oh man, I drove all the way out here and, I mean, obviously, that's how you decide your your uh, big life decisions is, you know, I, I spent money on gas to drive out here, so I'm committed now. Yeah, you passed the point of no return, and you're just like, I got to go with this. If, if I, I only would have known, it would have been way cheaper to just drive home. I would have done that. <laughs> if only. Uh, if only. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody could have told me that. <laughs> I would have sent you a ticket, dude. <laughs> <laughs> to the airport southwest counter. <laughs> yeah really i would have paid for that uber ride all the way home it would have been cheaper that would have been so worth it Jeez. <laughs> yeah it was pretty rough <laughs> so i'm thinking of a specific point too like after you guys got married there was a, a certain trip to visit family oh you god talk, you want to talk a little bit about their first impressions <laughs> <laughs> do i have to i mean you don't really have to but a, sounds like a loaded question yeah yeah i mean right just risk. any god any any opportunity to encounter any sort of conflict with anybody and it's just not gonna work out i mean she was all over the place from the beginning and then we went on a trip to go meet some family and she just wouldn't let things happen naturally you know and that and that's one thing that I think most people would be on board with if you're on a trip. You just kind of go with the flow a little bit. You know, you're in someone else's, you know, staying at someone else's house, kind of in someone else's town, right? And you're kind of, you know, relying on them to to kind of drive the the trip a little bit. It's not like we had, oh, well, Monday we're going to go here and Tuesday we're going to go here and it, you know, we're going to eat at noon exactly. Like I don't I don't travel like that. I don't know anybody who does. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe psychopaths, but anyway, like, she, you know, she just wouldn't let anything happen naturally like that. And she had to be the center of attention. If she was not the center of attention, she would make it so. I mean, just, you know, you've seen those old movies where the woman just faints and she's got her hand on her head and she falls back on her fainting couch, you know, that's <laughs> perched right behind her, thank right. God, right? Or else she would have fallen on the floor. It was like that. I mean, it's just so dramatic. So much overdone. drama. Ridiculous. You just can't have a good time. Yeah, it sounds You're exhausting. Constantly worried about if they're going to get upset or, you know, will they like what you decided? Or God forbid you got in the right side of the car instead of the left side of the car and they <laughs> wanted to sit on that. So, like it, it's just stuff as petty as that. I'm not exaggerating. It really yeah, is. 
the sad thing is that affects your thinking over time. And you start thinking that way about everything. You run everything past their filter first before you say it or do it. It's like, will this upset them? Will this make them happy? Yeah. And that's how you act. And it's so codependent, but that's what ends up happening, right? Like, yeah. And then you end up destroying your own truth because your truth is based on their perception of things, how they're going to react, what they think. So you don't even really know what's good or bad at that point. You're just kind of like, if it doesn't piss them off, then it must be good. And if it pisses them off, it must be bad. But that is, uh, there's no consistency with that. So, yeah. you, you know, you'll never know what's coming up next. If yeah, you're that's... basing your decisions on somebody else's feelings like that, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I was about to say that too, like in that whatever makes them happy is always changing what makes them upset. So like you can never keep up with it. So it's impossible either way. Yep. And and it seems too like if they feel like you're starting to, to catch on to some of their patterns, they mix it up on purpose because having predictability is like losing control too, in a way. Exactly. And to add to Hey, you invited me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I <laughs> let me know if this is too much. <laughs> you open the can of worms. It's too late now. We're, we're only in the first year. <laughs> you knew what this was. <laughs> you knew where this was going. I, I did. I did. <laughs> so you guys quickly found out you were going to have a, a baby. Surprise. Surprise. That was not uh, planned. Yeah, lock it down. Scenario. She probably planned it, but I didn't plan it. Yeah, they usually do. They want to lock you down pretty quick. Yeah. And it happened fast. Yeah, she was born two weeks before our first wedding anniversary. That's right. Yeah. Oh wow. It, it happened quick. Didn't yeah. waste any time. No. You can't. Got to. Got to keep them. Got to keep them engaged. Yeah, you mm-hmm. gotta lock that down. Yeah. Yep. They know what they're doing. They're not dumb. <laughs> Dude owns a house. <laughs> <laughs> gotta keep him. <laughs> got a <laughs> job. He's got a house. <laughs> what more could you want? I mean, sure. come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> as the the wedding reenactment, as we fi- fondly refer to it, <laughs> we we all had to show up for that. <laughs> was that that was your original wedding date, wasn't it? Uh, I think it was. That was too long ago uh, for me to remember. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but I think something like that. Yeah. We had a. Uh, specific people who were upset they didn't get to attend the wedding so we decided really? that uh, yeah the reenactment was the way to go so everyone felt like they'd be a part of it just so you know uh sasha and i were not part of that group <laughs> no we were like heck yeah go to elope we don't care <laughs> I, I had to convince i had to convince a lot of the uh the groomsmen to show up they were like aren't you already married why do we have to i don't understand yeah i got them there yeah not that she liked any of them but whatever yeah yeah of course not (laughs) speaking of non-concessions i was kidding (laughs) oh god (laughs) was there anything else you wanted to add about the the wedding reenactment (laughs) no i didn't even want to talk about it as much as i did okay fair enough fair enough (laughs) So moving on with your life. <laughs> I mean, it's you, you, if you step in a turd, you don't like look down at your shoe fondly. You know what I'm saying? Ah, try and get that off <laughs> as soon as you can and leave it behind you. You know, like, oh, look, I remember this turd. Yeah, I remember no. how bad it smelled. And you, know. <laughs> you buy new shoes is what was. you do. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you do. <laughs> when it's a turd that big, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Buy new socks too, if it's that yeah, big. Yeah, yeah. Just the whole thing. Maybe a foot soak. <laughs> it ruins everything. <laughs> Get a bucket um, of Purell for that. Oh my gosh. So I'm, and I'm sorry, this is going to probably bring up some terrible things too. Um, like as far as conflict within your home, what did that first year look like? Yeah, it was uh, it was fantastic. You know, going to uh, going to the store four times in the same day for different stuff mm-hmm. feels good. That sounds fun. I mean, trying to be a good husband and and you know do what you can for your wife who's pregnant and uh, you know not enjoying being pregnant. I was just oh man, it was bad. I was too nice. I'll say it, you know, I did too much. Well, yeah. You don't want to look like a jerk. Yeah. Pregnant and laid up in bed and you're trying to take care of her. You don't want to look like that. Yeah. And then, you know, you, 
oh i want this and we don't have it and it's always it was always something we didn't have you know i could have bought i could have bought half the store and i would have missed it or it would have been the wrong brand or something Mm -hmm. so it was it was a lot of that a lot of uh waiting on her and buying things for her and making her comfortable and you know all uh while sacrificing my own comfort it was it was true love Mm -hmm. you know on your part yeah i was (laughs) Mm -hmm. i was i'll admit i was good at it you know i did everything that i thought i should do but uh the problem is they'll always find something wrong you know because that's how they kind of keep you in that state of being afraid or you know just being in that i guess that uncertain mindset Mm-hmm. where you don't know if they're going to be okay with anything. It's like they have to get upset with something and throw that in there every once in a while, just so you don't get rusty. You know, they got to keep, <laughs> they don't they want gotta, you to be too comfortable. Yeah. You got to be on your toes 24 seven to jump at their every beck and call. Yeah, totally. Oh yeah. Even to get woken up in the middle of the night. Cause they need something. Got to mm-hmm. deal with that too. It's great. It's good stuff. Mm, that sounds awful. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, sorry. It's all right. Disaster. So this is going to be touchy too. um, Because I know you guys are telling me. Yeah, I'm just going to keep poking. I'm just going to be the underlying theme. Yeah, just just uh, we'll put that in the subtitles. Subtitles. Touchy, touchy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if I would have known this, I would have sat on a thumbtack or something before you started interviewing me. That's all. That's only if we give you a, a lie detector test. I'm just kidding. This would have been more comfortable. I don't know. <laughs> so we um we know that they um this person liked to to cause conflict with you and your your personal relationships. I mean, it, you can you can see the pattern so clearly afterwards. Somebody who. Anytime somebody gets close to you, if you spend any length of time with one friend, it doesn't matter if it's a girl or a guy or hell, it, it could be anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I like to play guitar and I got, I got in fights for playing guitar too much, you know, because yeah. I wasn't paying attention what? to her oh and it was, gosh. it's bad, you know, and, and like I said, it could be anybody, you know, she'll try to create strife within any relationship or they they like to do the making you pick one one person you know it's always them and somebody else or them mm-hmm. and something else or whatever it is so yeah. it's always like oh well you know if you cared about me you would give up this or i don't like that person they're rude or they're not nice to me or whatever if you really care about me you're not going to hang out with them anymore or whatever mm-hmm. it was yeah. a lot of that and i mean it was you know family members friends hobbies anything mm-hmm. it was always and when like you're that. married what like by the time you're married it's like well what do i have to do here i'm married obviously i have to choose my spouse you know yeah I don't really have much of a choice at that point yeah and you get to the point where you resent them because you look back and you're like i gave up this person and that person in this relationship and this thing that i really enjoy and this thing that i love doing and all I have is this person who keeps asking for more. They keep asking me to give up more stuff mm-hmm. and give them more and, you know, sacrifice yourself and your own wants and needs and desires so that they can be happy when they're never actually happy. There's nothing that actually gives them any true happiness. You know, that's why they keep asking for more stuff. That's why they'll always keep up on that it's it's never going to end you know anybody that's in that situation right now you just cut it and run there's no there's no fixing that there's no loving them into submission (laughs) believe me i tried it you know it's not gonna work Mm -hmm. i've been there too i get it yeah and they do all these things to you over a period of time that's slow it's like that boiling frog syndrome where you don't realize the water is getting hotter and hotter. And before you know it, there's nothing left of you. You're just, you're done, you know? Yeah. And you don't even know, you don't even know what you like anymore. That's the sad part. You yeah. try to, you know, they, they talk about, you know, when people get divorced. You kind of like revert back to what you were like when you were single. 
you know, you, you almost want to do that because you don't even remember what you like anymore. You don't remember who you are because your identity was always pleasing this person and doing everything you can to make them happy and, and all that other stuff. So it, it feels really weird when you finally do break ties with them and you're on your own, you almost like freeze deer in the headlights. Cause you don't know which direction to walk. Yeah. You're like I could do anything right now. And I don't really even know what I want to do. You know? Yeah. And even that thought is kind of terrifying in a way also oh, yeah. like going out on your own without that person. It's this unknown to you and it's scary. And people will say, well, why didn't you leave? Well, why didn't you just leave? And they don't understand it, but it's like this big life change you have to make because your whole life was based on this other person and what they wanted to do and like their control. And you don't even know how to be anymore. Like you're saying, you don't know what you like. You don't know what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's that true codependency. You know, that's, and that's who narcissists try to breed. You know, they find somebody who's empathetic, find somebody who's loving and they condition you to be codependent so that leaving them is the hardest thing you have to do. It really is. Yep. At what point did you come to the conclusion that, Hey, this is, I'm done. Like, I'm, I'm really done. Like, like done for real. Not, not the uh, other thousand times I thought about it. Well, you want to walk us up to, up to that point then? Um, Oh man, it's, yeah, it's like, um, it's like you have to build up to it. You have to get really upset and that, that sets the bar wherever it goes and it stays there. It doesn't go down. And you get really upset and it bumps it up a little bit and then something else happens and you're just constantly thinking, man, this isn't working. This isn't working. I'm, I'm going to counseling. I did this or that. I tried to please them. It's not working. And finally, when that meter gets all the way to the top, then you're like, yeah, I'm all, I'm already done. You know, mm-hmm. you've already built up that, that like resistance, <laughs> Like, I I don't know a better way to explain it, but it really is like that. It it pushes you a little bit further every time. And as time goes on, if you're, if you're really, uh, you know, somebody who can, who can look within yourself and, and try to see any of those signs, you'll get there. It, It takes a long time, but by the time you're there, you've checked out already. By the time I realized that it was over. I had been, I had been checked out for at least a year or two in my mind, you know? Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. And you guys did try couples counseling or just individual? Yeah, we tried couples counseling. What did that yeah. look like? Um, it was, it was kind of odd. I mean, it, you know, she made everything my fault, mm-hmm. uh, painted the picture of her as a victim from childhood. So basically I mean, taking over the whole process where it was all about her and she had these problems and I was a problem for her and I just needed to do this, that, and the other, and then things would work because it wasn't her fault. You know, it was me not communicating with her, me not sharing enough with her, even though, you know, she would ask me on my way home from work, if I left work five minutes late, I'd get a phone call. Where are you? What are you doing? What's taking so long? why can't you drive faster? All this other nonsense. And just like beating me up about it, it would always be my fault. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how the counseling went. And, you know, at the time I was trying to be, I was trying to be one of those, one of those people that would look at within myself and see, yeah, you know what? I am a messed up person. You know, I, I don't do everything right. I'm not perfect. So, you know, you try to look at, inwardly and try to fix things because you have your spouse who you assume loves you and wants the best for you. Plus we had a Christian counselor who, you know, you trust somebody that's, that's doing Christian family counseling and you want to go in that direction. So you just kind of, kind of walk along with it, you know, but now looking back, you see, man, I, I see how she drove that, that whole process toward what she wanted to accomplish. It wasn't, 
that our marriage was in jeopardy and we were fixing it. It was, I was out of line and she had to reprimand me. Mm -hmm. And basically I had to learn how to behave around her because that's the only thing that would make the marriage work is um, if I was submissive, you know? Wow. So what did, I'm not going to ask you who your counselor was, (laughs) um, but um, what, what was their reaction, I guess, to all these, her, her laundry list of, of wants? Um, I mean, they, they were, they were trying to do its best. I mean, they, they, again, like, like I did, they assumed that she loved me. She Mm -hmm. wanted the marriage to work. She had some problems in that. Maybe if we do, you know, these few steps, then we can get back to a neutral zone and then move on from there. Mm -hmm. And the marriage would get stronger as a result and all that stuff. You know, all the things that, you know, everybody says when you go to counseling, you got to kind of like break things down to basics and then you can build them back up and they'll be stronger, you know? And I think every, you know, myself and the, and the counselor both, you know, really took it for granted that she had her own agenda at the the time. Yeah. They're really good at fooling people like that and appearing genuine and Oh, you know, yeah. they always have these childhood traumas they can refer back to. And then you feel like a jerk again, if you don't like offer any sensitivity towards it. So there, it's just insane how well they manipulate people and people fall for their stuff all the time. Sadly. It's the truth. Yeah. We talk about uh, married at first sight, how they get through those, that vetting, you know, they, they can fool anybody. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. And doctors. Um, yep. Yeah, especially in a controlled environment, you're you're talking to somebody for, you know, an hour once a week for a few months. Mm-hmm. Oh, they can hold it together for an hour. Yeah, they're good actors. Yeah. They can yeah. do it. Yeah, you know, like cry on command kind of good acting. Right. Yeah. Oh and my gosh, do. that is so accurate. They do. Yeah. Whatever will accomplish whatever they want, they'll mm-hmm. make it happen. Their little speeches, their little heartfelt speeches that you're like, oh man, they're so genuine and they really mean it and they want to change. And then the next day comes and they revert back to their old behavior and nothing is different. So, yep. Wow. And what was the, like the, the nail in the coffin for you, Tony? Ooh, this marriage. I just, I don't think it was one thing. Like I said, I I think it really just built up, you know, because after a while I was just over it. You know, Mm -hmm. I decided that she was going to be upset with me regardless. And I had to start taking my own identity back and trying to figure out what I needed to do to be okay with myself instead of just trying to please her all the time. So a lot of it was, you know, when she would throw little fits and get upset, I just wouldn't care, Mm -hmm. you know, and as cold as it sounds, that's what I had to do. I, I would just say, you know, if you're going to be upset about this, this is a stupid thing to get mad about. You can go be mad over there and I'm going to sit here and watch TV or I'm going to spend time with the kids and you can go off by yourself if you want, but I'm not going to let your tantrums and your agenda affect my life in that negative way anymore. Cause I was depressed. I mean, I was just, I had all kinds of problems at that point. I had a job that I hated, you know, and I was just like, I just didn't care. So I took that energy and I was like, you know what? She's the source of all this angst and anxiety for me. I'm just not going to give a crap what she does, you know? Mm -hmm. And she would come in raving about whatever. And I'd be like, all right, see you later. You know? And it's like I said, it sounds cold, but Mm -hmm. when you see it for what it is and it's Mm -hmm. a farce to try to manipulate a reaction out of you, not giving a reaction is the most powerful thing you can do for somebody Mm -hmm. like that, because it shows them you're taking back control of yourself Mm -hmm. and they don't, they're not at the helm anymore. Right. Yeah. That's really interesting. I never put it together before, but I actually went to some Al-Anon meetings and they teach you detachment is what they call it. And it sounds kind of like that's the way that you went unintentionally was like, you have a problem and it's not my job to fix it. And I know that. And I'm not going to waste any more of my energy on that. And like, that's what they teach you in Al-Anon when you are in a relationship or, you know, you have a family member with an addiction or a drinking problem, you know, they teach you that's not your problem to fix that they need to take responsibility for it. 
yeah, like I never put those two things together until just the second, but it's, it's very similar. And in my case, it was actually both things that were coming into play. So I definitely understand what you're saying. Yeah. And it's, it's a powerful thing to do. And it helped me get it to a place where when we finally did officially separate and start the divorce procedure, I was ecstatic. And it sounds that again, I end up sounding kind of like a jerk, but you have (laughs) that freedom and you feel like you're not stuck in this cell any longer. You're not a part of it anymore. You've walked outside and you're by yourself. You're in charge of whether or not you're happy or sad or anxious or whatever. And if they want to be pissed, if they want to do whatever they want to do, they're over there and you don't have to see it. You don't have to worry about it. And after dealing with that for 10 years, you were just beside yourself. I mean, it's like a, it's like a cartoon where you go outside and the, the birds are singing and the sun's shining through the clouds. There's a rainbow. Beautiful. Yep. It is. I know I live by that mantra, like that freedom is priceless after my divorce. And it was scary to go through it, but there's just such a weight that's lifted from you. You don't carry around that every day and you can actually think clearer and like that brain fog is dissipating and you're free and there's nothing better than being free. Like no amount of money can, can compare to that. Not at all. And that brain fog is, that's a real thing. I mean, like I said, you don't know who you are. You don't know what you like you're kind of in this constant state of reacting to someone else. So you, you end up looking back and you're like, I don't even know how I got here. The last 300 steps I took were because I was dodging stuff, looking down at the ground and you look up and you don't recognize any of the landscape anymore. And it, it feels like that. You're just like in a, in a complete fog. Right. You just have those blinders. That's a perfect analogy. Like looking at the ground. Yeah. Like you're stuck on all these little tiny details and you don't see what's really around you. That is so true. That's exactly how it feels. Yeah. It's like walking two miles on a sidewalk, trying not to step on cracks and just looking down. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you look up and you're two miles away from your house. You don't even know where the, where you are anymore. How you got there. Kind of, yeah. yeah. It kind of feels you're like that. Lost. Yeah. You were the one that broached the divorce um, topic. How did that go down? Oh gosh. Uh, she was pissed. Yeah. Um, I mean, narcissists never like anyone to break up with them. So she decided that she was going to make me tell the kids as like my punishment. Mm -hmm. And then she was going to make it seem like it was her idea to some people. And then to some people, like she was a victim. So it ended up being a big mess. I mean, she told everyone kind of a different story, which in the end, you know, didn't work out for her because, you know, people talk to each other, especially her own family, you know, (laughs) and they figured out (laughs) that she was lying about all of it. But I think at that point too, I, I really think that she didn't believe that I would go through with it all or that if I did go through with it all, she'd somehow still have me on a hook so that she was still in control, even if we weren't legally married anymore. And she could have the freedom to not only control me, but control her boyfriend too. And she was just like multiplying the people underneath her, you know? And I really think she got blindsided by me detaching myself the way that I did. And that was the best thing I could have ever done. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Amen. Had you tried to leave before? Uh, not really. Mm-hmm. Not really. I mean, we were kind of, uh, like I said, I mean, I was checked out before the divorce. We didn't even sleep in the same room for like at least a year before we got divorced. Like it was, we were going in that direction. Yeah but I didn't actually leave. I mean, part of that too was I didn't want to leave. I I felt like if I left the house, I would never get back in. Mm -hmm. She was the kind of vindictive person that she would have 
not let me back in and probably would have destroyed all of my stuff and it would just would have been a mess. And how long did divorce proceedings take? Was it pretty amicable as as amicable as it could be? Um it only was because I didn't want her to back out of it, so I kind of just signed whatever papers she put in front of me at the time just to make it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't recommend doing that. Now looking back on it, it was a a nightmare, but I just I was so over it. I just wanted it to be done so that we couldn't go back. You know, cuz I felt like and and she threatened me with, you know, if you don't agree with these things, you know, we'll get attorneys and we'll duke it out. And I was like, I don't want to go there. I just want to get this over with. Yeah. You know? Fair enough. And we, we won't talk about anything that's um, ongoing legal, but um, that, that first year was, was pretty challenging for you. Do you want (laughs) to, do you want to give like a summary of the stuff that's already been kind of resolved? Oh, wow. We have that much time? Yeah, we got time. How much time you got? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean like throughout getting divorced and then and then me, I mean I didn't cut I didn't cut her off completely just at first. I was trying to keep things as amicable as possible just because I thought that would be the best way for the kids to to see us interacting in a positive way. The unfortunate thing is, you know, as as I wasn't taking her crap anymore, she was still try to control the situation. If we were ever in the same place or, you know, calling me or texting me constantly asking to help her with stuff, you know, just trying to have that, that leash on me and me not succumbing to that. Me saying no to her just made her more upset. Yeah. And it was, uh, it got ugly. Uh, I think the worst part of it was that I found out, after the divorce was final and everything that she had uh she mi- misrepresented some things on the child support calculator so that I would have to pay her more money every month and I wasn't having that I wasn't very happy about it so I at that point hired an attorney to get it fixed so once she found out that I was doing that all hell broke loose you yeah. know I was messing with her income at that point so it, any all any interaction we had was an altercation i mean mm-hmm. between her gosh she kicked the side of my car one time um i was in the car one time and she was trying to fight with me and try to open the door to get at me in the car and i ended up having to drive away just to get away from her mm-hmm. um i mean her calling the police on me for this, that, and the other, you know, things that never even happened, just allegations against me for whatever she thought she might get me for. Cause at that point it was about winning, you know, and, and with narcissists, that's the thing is they got to feel like they won. And if they feel like they're not in control and they're not winning, they will do damn near anything to make that win happen. Yeah. And you know, criminal activity is not off the table at all. Yep. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to get an update on on the rest of that another time. Yeah. <laughs> once uh once all the legal stuff is That's a whole is other over. story. Holy yeah. smokes. <laughs> so if you um can look back at the uh the red flags that were part of your decor as as uh dr romani would say (laughs) what uh, what uh advice would you give somebody that's that's getting into a relationship like yours i think the biggest the biggest thing would be if you feel like they're pushing you to do something wait even if you have to dig your heels in time will tell who they are because these people cannot keep it together for any length of time. You know, they want to be with you all the time and spend time with you. Let that happen, but be conscious enough of what's going on to be able to step back and examine what's happening, you know, Mm -hmm. to see who they really are because, you know, aside the love bombing will happen and it'll be all, 
rainbows and butterflies and stuff it'll look great at first but don't don't just rush in you know you kind of keep your distance for a little while and and let things settle down past that honeymoon stage of dating Mm -hmm. where you're starting to like do things together and see them in situations where they're amped up and see how they react and how they treat other people. And that's a good indicator. I mean, if I would have realized that I, I would have bailed real quick, mm-hmm. you know, cause they're just high conflict personalities. So anybody that they interact with on a regular basis, there's going to be a lot of conflict there. And if you know somebody that's constantly fighting with their parents and their siblings and their best friends are their friend one week and not the other week, you just run the hell away from them because that's going to happen to you. You're not an exception to that rule and you, no one is. Mm-hmm. What nope. about, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Sasha. <laughs> no, that's all I was going to say. I agree. 100. Yeah. You concur? I, concur? I totally concur. <laughs> Do you you should concur, concur, doctor. I concur. Doctor, did you concur? <laughs> and last question for you. What uh, what advice would you have for the bystanders watching this happen? Well, I'm sure your friends saw red flags. I know your parents did. The especially if the person involved is has got the rosy glasses on. This sounds really really messed up and weird. But the thing that really got me was record it. Everybody's got a phone. You can record video, audio, whatever. Record it and play it back to them later. Because when you're in the moment, for some reason, you don't hear all of those little nuances and, you know, all of that nastiness when it comes out. But after the fact, when you listen back to it, it sounds 10 times worse. Mm-hmm. From experience, I'll tell you, it sounds way worse <laughs> if you record some of this crap. So if you, I mean, obviously try to have a conversation with this person first and say, Hey man, there's some red flags here or whatever. If they blow you off and they're like, no, she was just having a bad day or he was just mad about this or, you know, they have these problems from whatever, just take a step back, basically just catch them in the act, record something, see something happen and present hard evidence you'll see if the narcissist is is presented with any hard evidence they'll deny it too Mm -hmm. so it just makes them look ridiculous because you can't you know it's like that stupid shaggy song where he says it wasn't me you can't just say it's not you when you're right there on the sofa you know what i'm saying (laughs) i see you i know what i saw you got to present them with this and just be like hey this is you right here this is who you are this is who you're dating or whatever and just show it to them and be like you know you don't want any part of this person you know and it's tough to have that conversation with anybody but it's for their own good yeah because these people aren't getting better they never do us to the end of part one of our series on narcissistic abuse. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe and like so that you don't miss the rest of the series. And now, an outtake. What if it's the first time he's hearing this and he gets <laughs> he's thrown all off? For- <laughs> <laughs> no, I I called it that too because oh, it okay, wasn't okay. like a vow renewal; it was a reenactment. Yeah, yeah, it was like the wedding happened, and we're kind of doing it again. Yeah, it was like a Civil War reenactment and I lost.